Director of Mobility by Dan Sperling from UC Davis. Uh, Brian Youngers, who's a student at UC Davis uh, working on his PhD. Uh, Jeff Wardle from the uh, High Priesthood of Car Design in Pasadena, uh, talking about car design. And Christopher Lindstrom, who's going to talk about what's happening in Europe and what they're doing on the pod car. I'm Ron Swenson. I'm a member of the board. And I have a, a, a listing somewhere in the program about uh, sol solar revolution. You can check that out on the web. Uh, just to set the stage very quickly, uh, we've seen two phenomena kind of uh, come together in this uh, environment today. People talking about peak oil, but also looking at the climate change. The latest is a, set, uh, a article came out today. Um, about possibility of huge methane uh, uh, emissions coming off the floor of the Arctic Ocean. So we may, in fact, be in the, at the fork in the road. <laughs> and I had a friend back in the 70s, Dave Wang, started the Environmental Studies Program at San Jose State. He said there were two kinds of businessmen. He was a Chinese guy, so you know how those things are. You have good businessmen and bad businessmen. We're talking economics now. We've been talking a lot about economics, so I'm going to give you my version, thanks to Dave Wang. A good businessman is selling. Bad businessman is buying. So what are we looking at here in the good old US of A? Are we going to continue to be buying fuels from outside the country, or are we going to wake up and look at some other interesting possibilities and take the lead from a technological point of view? Or are we going to degrade to this? I'd like to introduce Dan Sperling. He is the director of the Institute of Transportation Studies from UC Davis. He serves on the California Air Resources Board. And he's writing a new book, Two Billion Cars. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to be talking with both hats of mine on my head, one as an academic, one as a regulator. I'm going to be, try to be entertaining. I'm trying to be educational and informative, and the part of it will be to, for you to figure out when do I have my academic hat on and when do I have my regulator hat on. So. This is clearly my academic slide. Um, but this is a very important slide. This is a slide. This, is, this happens to be for France, but it could be for the United States as well. And it shows how much more people have moved other than walking uh, over history. And so in the, around 1800, people were traveling about 50 meters, uh, mostly on horses little waterways. And this scale on the left is uh, logarithmic, which means this is an exponential curve. So now we're up, as you can see, up to about 40,000 uh, meters per day, 40,000 uh, uh, 40, uh, meters. And so what we're doing, and this curve continues into the future by almost any forecast. And in the future, We'll be traveling much more by high-speed modes, especially air. But so this is kind of the history of transportation and the future of transportation. And if we bring it to the United States and, and to uh, the uh, near term here, in the recent past, the population of the US has been going up slowly, but the number of vehicles has been going up faster than the population. And the amount of driving we do with those vehicles has been increasing at an even faster rate. Now, in the past year, for the first time, actually, the first time of modern history, not counting the wars, World War II, uh, the vehicle travel has flattened out and even decreased a little bit, uh, mostly because of the high fuel prices. And you know, we can think about 
you know, what that really means for the future. But uh, if you think fuel prices are going to keep going up, then you'll probably think the vehicle travel will come down a little more. If you think it'll stabilize, it'll, uh, it'll continue to, the travel will continue to increase. So, you know, as we talk about mobility, you know, all mobility is not equal. All vehicle trips are not high value. Um, but if we think about this more in a historical context, you know, we've come a long way. The transportation system today is, is vastly superior to what it was. Um, the cars are much better, the roads are much better, and it's led to a much higher quality of life and a you know, much greater economic productivity. And you know, there's other attributes that have come along with this improving transportation system. But then there's the downsides. You know, this is the 50s in LA, where air pollution, 50s and 60s, where air pollution was very severe, and other, other cities around the world are experiencing those very severe levels of air pollution, most of it from vehicles. Um, another uh, outcome is, <laughs> you know, at some point, the value of the car starts diminishing, right? And you stole that slide from me. <laughs> That's my slide. <laughs> where, where is that, by the way? I'll leave that with you. So it was Photoshop. You're, uh, some, I heard someone say that. That's right. So uh, you know, it did look like the San Fernando Valley, though, to me. Uh, and then there's you know a lot of the developing. Uh, uh, world cities around, you know, in, in many countries, in Asia, even in, you know, even in Nigeria, where the congestion is, is very severe, you know, in this, this case it's a lot of people um, mixed in with the vehicles, but we're seeing this uh, everywhere in the world, even with places that have much lower levels of vehicle ownership than we do here. And so, here's a slide, this is a history of vehicles in the world. We're at about, in the world today, we're at about one billion vehicles. And that's about, about two-thirds of those are cars and light trucks, and then there's that, you know, heavier trucks and buses, and then motorcycles and scooters on top of that. But altogether, it's about a billion, and th these are the kinds of forecasts, these are the conventional forecasts, uh, the, you know, the conventional wisdom forecasts of what's going to happen. And you see it's a, it's a very steep slope into the future. Now, one of the reasons these, uh, everyone expects this steep increase is because uh, cars and vehicles are getting cheaper. This is a vehicle being produced, that will be produced shortly by Tata. It's a, a big conglomerate in India. And this car is the Nano. They're planning to sell it for $2,500. And it's not just this company. All of the major car companies in the world are designing cheaper and cheaper cars that they can sell, mostly in the developing countries, but also uh, in the more affluent countries as well. So as you build more cheap cars, they become available to a much wider uh, group of people in the part of the population. And you know, some of the, you know, there's all kinds of vehicles being produced. The, this, one of the very interesting stories is in China, uh, last year, about 15 million electric vehicles were sold. 15 million. They were electric motorcycles, electric scooters, and electric bikes. But it is by far the, the, the largest electric vehicle industry in the world. And this is a, a picture of it. And one of the questions is, is this going to be uh, where the future electric vehicles come from, where the technology and the industry and the products come from? Could it be China? Um, transportation takes a lot of forms. There's congestion of very forms in different places. So, um, bringing back to the, quantitatively, um, if the, the, this is a graph of the density of cities around the world. And the lowest densities, by far, are in the United States. Those are the red ones up at the top. But all of the cities of the world are becoming less dense. All of the cities, every metropolitan area in the world 
is, is experiencing decreasing uh, uh, density. They're spreading out, you know, sprawl, you know, to you know, use an expression that we use here. And if you, even if you go to Europe, you know, many of us when we go to Europe, we go to Paris and we see, you know, the metro and all the good things there. But if you go into the suburbs of Paris, it's starting to look remarkably like Los Angeles. And that's what we're seeing everywhere in the world. And what this means is we've created in, in you know, California is, is, is the pioneer of the car-centric society, the car-centric living in the world. This is where it started in California. And we've created now in the United States a car monoculture. It's, you know, mass transit now accounts for only 2% of passenger travel in this country, 2%. You know, air travel is 10% and almost all the rest is cars. And so we've, got, we've created a system that is very resistant to change where, you know, transit, even if you doubled mass transit, it's still a tiny part of the, of the total transportation system and the way people move. So one of the ideas, you know, we're talking about mobility here and the mobility ties directly back to oil use and, and greenhouse gases and climate change is we need to be thinking about our transportation system in a very different way. We're going to be hearing about one innovation with, uh, with the small pods, personal pods, uh, and, and that's one innovation. What we need is innovation. You know, that's really the key. There's been very little innovation in the transportation system. The transportation system now is really, in terms functionally, hasn't changed in 80 years. You know, the roads are basically the same. The vehicles are basically the same. They're, more, they're safer and you know, faster. Um, they actually consume about the same amount of energy uh, as well. And so you know, we've created this monoculture, and we've, created, we've locked in this system. And what we need is more choice. And, and we've not seen that created in, in the transportation system. So one of the ways of doing it is using information technologies to create what what we sometimes call smart paratransit, what used to be called dial-a-ride, but providing jitney services uh, that, that's on call through the internet, creating smart car sharing, uh, creating neighborhood electric vehicles, connecting it, you know, managing land use better, uh, connecting it up with better use of bicycles, uh, connecting it up with, all, with telecommuting and other kinds of teleconferencing and, and neighborhood teleconference centers. There's all kinds of things. What we need to do is create choice because until we have choice, we're not going to be able to adopt policies or strategies to reduce vehicle use. You know, it's going to be seen as just punishment. So we need a lot more innovation. Um, one of the other innovations is in Paris. Just in the last couple of years, they've started a rent-a-bike system you know, that actually is playing a very large role now in people getting around in Paris where you just swipe a card and get your bike and then you return it at another uh, location and they have these locations all through Paris now. And so, you know, that's kind of the backdrop. So now let me kind of focus on, you know, okay, now I'm putting my regulator hat on here, um, policymaker hat on. And so in California, you know, as you've been hearing from other presentations as well, California has a goal, has a law that requires us to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions back to, 20, back to 1990 levels by, by 2020. And, and that's a, a big jump. So if you, if you follow this curve, you go up to 2004. You know, we're just a little beyond that now. But if we continued business as usual, you'd be going up to that last big um, blue column there. And that represents about a 28% uh, increase over 1990 levels. So what we're aiming for, what we have a law that says is we must reduce the emissions back to 1990 levels. That represents about a 28% reduction. Uh, and that's from business as usual. That's a big reduction. But an even bigger reduction is to get that 50 to 80% reduction, reduction that the climate scientists say is necessary to stabilize the climate, to get that by 2050. That requires really major changes, certainly in our transportation system, which is what I'm going to focus on. So um, just to kind of give you a little backdrop on this, you know, in California we have this law, AB 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. It was passed in 2006, signed by the governor, 
Uh, and there's a whole uh, number of steps along the way to get to 2020, but we're uh, next month, or actually early in November, the board is going to adopt the scoping plan, basically the master plan of how we're going to get to that 2020 reduction. And, you know, that's the cap and trade and the low carbon fuel standards and standards on vehicles and reductions on vehicle travel. All of that is going to be in this one plan, in this one document. And after that's adopted in, no in November, we're going to start the rulemaking process to figure, you know, to adopt the specific rules to, to accomplish those reductions. So to bring it back to transportation, uh, worldwide, uh, transportation accounts for about one-fourth of all the greenhouse gases in the world. In, Calif in the U.S., it's about a third. In California, it's about 38 percent. So California has uh, transportation accounts for a, a very big share, share of the CO2 and the greenhouse gases in California. Transportation, or California, also, in California also, we use a much larger share of our oil for transportation. In California, about three-quarters of all the oil is used for transportation. Nation, nationally, it's about two-thirds. So um, let me talk a little bit what we need to do about transportation. So we can think of it sometimes as there's a three-legged stool in terms of the strategies. Uh, we have to do something about the vehicles, making them more efficient. We need to decarbonize the fuels, and we need to reduce vehicle travel. And so there's a whole number of policies and rules that are, are being adopted. Uh, and, you know, and you see here the numbers, those gray uh, numbers show uh, of the reductions that are anticipated and planned for, how much is coming from each of those three areas. And so you'll see by 2020, the biggest reduction is, is planned to come from vehicles by making them more fuel efficient and reducing their greenhouse gases. Uh, you know, and, and that means by, uh, mostly by making them more efficient, but also uh, doing things like uh, using lower carbon refrigerants and the air conditioners in the vehicle, uh, making them more aerodynamic. And then, and, and, and I've been talking about cars here, but we're doing similar, we're doing others not quite as aggressively, but doing similar things with large trucks as well. And then the fuels, uh, the low carbon fuel standard is a uh, principal policy instrument, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So. What we need to do, and we're going to hear more about it, Brian Younger is going to talk about it next also, we need to transform our vehicles. We need to convert them for the most part to electric drive propulsion. And that means operating on electricity with batteries, plug-in hybrids, fuel cells using hydrogen, as well as uh, biofuels as a third option. So we're talking about uh, converting most of our vehicles to electric drive, because electric drive is much more efficient. It gives us the flexibility to move to some of these lower carbon fuels. We also need to transform our fuels. And because this is, you know, this conference is about oil, uh, let me dwell on this just for a moment. And that is because I think by far the most important policy anywhere in the world in terms of transforming the oil industry, of making a transition to lower carbon fuels and alternative fuels is the low carbon fuel standard. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I was involved in designing it, but I was involved in designing it because I did believe that this was the most important policy we could embrace. And what this policy framework does is, and this is being adopted in California shortly, and, uh, you know, it, there's a good chance it'll eventually be adopted nationally uh, by, the, by the U.S. government. Uh, Canada is looking at it. The European Union is looking at it very seriously. What this does is it puts in place a framework. You know, the problem we always have is, you know, government picking winners uh, and government's not very good at picking winners. Uh, industry's really good at being creative and innovative if they're given, given the task. So what the low carbon fuel standard does is it gives the task to industry. It says, in the case of California, you need to reduce the carbon associated with your fuels. Actually, it's the greenhouse gases, and it's a life cycle standard. So you need to reduce the life cycle greenhouse gases uh, for every unit of energy by 10% by 2020. And we're not going to tell you how to do it. 
We don't even know how to do it. But we know you know how to do it. And so we're going to give you the flexibility. It's a performance standard. So you know what you got to do. You know what's going to be 2020. And you know after 2020, we're going to tighten it up even more. So this is a path. This is a transformation path. And you know, if you can't do it or it's too expensive for you, you know, the, the point of regulation will be the oil industry. But if you can't do it, if you don't want to use biofuels or biofuels are difficult or expensive, you can, you can sell hydrogen, you can sell electricity, you can sell natural gas. If you don't want to do that, you can buy credits from other companies that will sell it. So it creates a market. And so in that way, it stimulates the innovation and creates, and creates incentives. And so it's not ad hoc, it's a durable framework, and it's a permanent framework. And then the third part, and the last part, the third leg, is dealing with vehicle use. And this is, in many ways, this is the most difficult part of the process, partly because the whole first part of the talk I just gave is people value personal mobility. And we see, you know, of course, we've seen it in California, we've seen it in the US, and we're seeing it in, in Delhi, and we're seeing it everywhere in the world. And the challenge is, I believe, is we have to create more choice. We have to learn how to manage land use better. And there's all kinds of political and financial issues involved in that. You know, in California, it's how Prop, Prop 13 funds, how Prop 13 is administered, how a lot of taxes are administered. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of barriers and a lot of forces working in the other direction. But ultimately, this is important because otherwise, the increase, if we just allow vehicle travel to keep increasing, it's gonna swamp everything else we do. In any way, there's lots of good reasons to restrain vehicle use. There's many good reasons for doing it. So, um, in closing, everything I just, you just heard from me is in this book. <laughs> two billion cars, it's coming out in two months. Uh, it covers what's happening in, with oil and the oil industry, cars, consumers, policy, and, and, uh, and it's with that note that I'll uh, leave you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. Next, we're going to hear from a fellow uh, who is, uh, I met a couple of years ago at the uh, UC Davis. Uh, in 1972, I worked with a group of students to build their own homes at the campus. It's a bunch of domes. That goes back to the, the days of communes and all in California. Anyway, it's still there. And uh, Brian moved in about a year ago. He just moved from unit number 10 to number 15. So uh, I want you all to welcome uh, Brian Jungers. Thank you, Ron. Um, I'm very honored to be here to be able to speak with you today. Um, as the, uh, the youngster, I ask that you uh, take a little pity on me, and if I lose my words or say something really ridiculous, uh, just ignore it, please. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, increasing fuel economy um, through redesigning personal vehicles, and historically, it's been shown that consumers, particularly in America, don't really value fuel economy very much. And so I subtitled this, A Revaluation of Energy Use and Economy. So quick survey. Um, how did you all get here this week? Uh, how many people flew? Uh, quite a few, yeah. Uh, drove? Got some drivers? Yeah. Uh, train? Anyone train? Got a couple of us, yeah. Um, was, it, was it ideal transportation for you? Did it meet all of your needs? Did you feel like you actually had a choice uh, when you decided how you're gonna transport here? Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there aren't a lot of choices, like Dan was saying, um, and that's part of the problem. Not a lot of fuel choices and not a lot of transportation choices for people um, to make. Um, you know, it'd be great if you could sail here instead of flying, but how much time is that gonna take? Um, this bike here is actually made out of bamboo and hemp. Um, it's really uh, amazing construction, um, but costs a pretty penny. And uh, these, 
these shopping cart vehicles. Um, I, I met the guy who designed these at MIT last summer, and you know, amazing idea, but we don't see them yet. Um, these options aren't really available uh, to a lot of people. Uh, a personal motivation of mine um, has been um, continued marginalization of people who are finding it hard to meet the American dream. Um, economic reasons, other reasons, as energy costs increase, we see more and more people marginalized. Um, personally, I grew up in a low income uh, family and it was, it was really difficult to um, pay for uh, our energy requirements, especially in a system where there was no infrastructure for uh, things like public transit. So global motivations, um, I really like this quote by Kevin Danaher, uh, two types of people in the world, those who think there are two types of people in the world and those who know that there is only one. Uh, we're all in this together. Um, it really is a matter of solidarity if we want to address these huge, huge problems that we face today. So I'm part of a project right now, it's called the Vehicle Design Summit, and it was started at MIT by a couple of undergraduate students there in 2006. And the intent of the project was to bring students together in a way that really hadn't been done before. Um, in the past, all of these student vehicle design competitions um, have been just that, they're competitions. Uh, students all work independently, they come together occasionally and compete, and they see who wins. Um, and what you'll notice if you pay attention to these competitions is that, the, is that the designs are very similar. They kind of streamline because they're boxed in by the constraints of the competition and the rules. And um, there's not really that much innovation. It's, it's a little bit stagnant. And so the students at MIT decided they would invite all of these other teams to come and join them and build cars together and see what they could come up with. And they came up with a lot of uh, pretty impressive designs and they did it in a really short time. Um, so as you'll notice, we have students in India, we have students in China, Africa, uh, many teams in Europe, and so it's definitely a global effort and it's almost entirely volunteer. Um, some of my own personal inspiration and the inspiration of our team at Davis, um, you know, dreamers like Buckminster Fuller who have these amazing ideas uh, and see changes that can be made in the world. Um, I was really fortunate to meet Paul McCready a few times uh, before he passed away last year and he inspired me quite a bit as one of the most amazing engineers that has ever lived. Um, and I've been fortunate to work with Andy Frank quite a bit at UC Davis and he's a very stubborn man. He works very hard. He's been working on plug-in hybrids for a very long time. And so um, this picture is the team um, of us that are working at UC Davis and working on the Vehicle Design Summit. So how is progress coming along in terms of uh, improving fuel economy? Well, over a 15-year period, you see an improvement of about one mile per gallon in fuel economy. Um, and that doesn't account for people driving more or um, other such changes in, in fuel use. And so I don't think we're quite progressing quickly enough to address these problems that we see with energy use, um, especially if we continue to increase uh, the amount of driving that we do. Uh, they say that transportation is a drive demand um, and we're just deriving more and more of it, it seems, um, to meet whatever other needs we have um, in this life. So what is the vision? The vision is the name of the vehicle that we're designing um, through this project. Um, the vision is a vehicle that actually can support um, the other sorts of things we'd like to see in life, clean energy, supported communities that work together, car sharing, um, just a revolution of how we travel, how we use energy. Um, the other team pictured on the right is a Belgian team. They're working on the electric motor design and we've been working quite closely with them um, over the last year or so. So this is the car. It was designed by TU Delft, uh, a, a team there in the Netherlands. And um, it's, it's flashy and, and pretty, I like it. Um, here's a prototype 
it was actually just finished a few days ago. Um, this picture is hot off the presses. It's sitting in a museum in Turin, Italy. And uh, you can see they've got all the body panels stripped off of it. That's what's sitting uh, in, the, in the background. Um, but it's a series plug-in hybrid design. It has an electric motor that provides all of the traction power. And it has a small engine generator that can provide backup power um, for extended driving. And so it's, it's extremely lightweight. It's designed for four to six passengers, um, though it's a it's relatively small vehicle. And the first um, commercialization of this vehicle will be in India. Um, we've been pretty well publicized. And as a result, we've had a lot of critics. Um, we've met with many, many, many industry folks. And a lot of them think that we're, you know, we're just kids and that it's just kind of a game that we're playing. And in a way, they're, they're right. I mean, we're learning, and we don't really know what we're doing. Uh, we're figuring that out all the time. But um, as we learn and as we fail, um, we continue to grow and, and gain more uh, supporters. Uh, we're, we're a bit of a, a liability for the universities because the way this is structured um, is something that most universities has ne have never dealt with before. Uh, this sort of cooperation and sharing of, or you know, managing of uh, intellectual property is kind of new. Uh, and the public often thinks it's too good to be true and that we're selling a line. And you know, sometimes it feels like maybe we are selling a line, but I hope that we aren't. Um, my mom really hopes that we, uh, we really can accomplish something here. So um, we're raising, we're trying to raise a, a million dollars over the next uh, month. And so if you have any leads on money, I know the investment's all tanked and all that, but um, you know, come find me afterwards. Um, and everyone always asks, you know, what do I drive? Um, I, I don't drive that, but um, mostly I just ride my bike because I live in Davis. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, the first time I met Brian, he had his sleeves rolled up and he was in Andy Frank's uh, shop. So this is a fellow who's uh, put his hands to work on this whole subject. I'm, I'm proud of him for that. Um, Dan is going to have to leave early. Is that still the case? So I gathered up a few questions. I thought I'd take one or two here uh, just to uh, take advantage of the, uh, of the circumstances. Um, Currently, automobiles are about 5% efficient. How efficient is a fuel cell, a fuel efficient car? Uh, car Is an electric car any more efficient than a gasoline car in BTUs per passenger mile? So what's, tell us a little bit about efficiency. Well, when you use efficiency in just about comparing different combustion engine vehicles, it's a very good measure. When you start doing it across fuels, it's, it's less useful. You know, a, a BTU of sun solar energy is, is very different than a BTU of fossil energy, for instance. But generally speaking, a fuel cell vehicle running on hydrogen uh, will be about two, two, two and a half times uh, more efficient per unit of energy than a conventional combustion, comparable combustion engine vehicle. Okay. Um we're here to talk about uh, peak oil. Uh, the question is, um, how is the California Air Resources Board uh, dealing with uh, peak oil in the context of its, uh, its endeavors and, in particular, tying that in with AB 32? Well, the, the, the mission of the Air Resources Board is to reduce air pollution and greenhouse gases. Um, you know, the, it works closely with the Energy Commission, whose mission is to reduce uh, energy use. Um, but the, the, the climate strata, the climate policies, almost every single climate policy or strategy uh, to reduce greenhouse gases is the same policy and strategy you would want to reduce oil use and energy use. And the one area where that's not true or not exactly true is when you get into some of the high carbon fossil sources like oil sands, tar sands, heavy oils. But I would argue in that case, by setting the low carbon fuel standard, it provides an incentive to the industry to be even more efficient in how they produce that, 
those uh, fuels from the, from the tar sands and to reduce the, the carbon footprint. So uh, for the most part, everything that we do you know, in California for the climate strategy, climate policy, is what we would want to do for uh, oil use reduction as well. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, let's move on now to our third presenter. This Jeff Wardle is, uh, uh, as I said earlier, he is one of the leading car design uh, instructors in the world. Uh, his students are in the leading studios, the design studios for half a dozen of the manufacturers who uh, many have uh, established their design in Pasadena. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you, Ron. Uh, control F. There we go. Oh, go back Tra to. Uh, oops, the other way. And I had it all set for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, good afternoon. I'm very privileged and honored to have been asked to talk at an ASPO conference. It's my first conference. I've heard some wonderful things. And. Um, I also feel honored to be uh, asked to talk about car design, although I have to say I feel a little bit uncomfortable about talking about car design in front of peak oilers. Feels a little bit like being asked to explain to uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous group how to make wine and beer at home. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so I better explain myself, I guess. Why am I here? Uh, at a very early age, I realized that I wanted to be involved in uh, creating new kinds of transportation, and I followed my instincts, and I followed some advice back in the dark ages of the UK when I was brought up. Uh, took an engineering degree, in ve uh, a vehicle engineering, vehicle and mechanical engineering degree first, and understood that that wasn't really the route to what I was wanting to do, which was to change the way transportation was. So I did my master's degree at the Royal College of Art in Automotive Design. And uh, after that, worked for several car companies around the world designing cars. So yes, I am a car designer. Uh, but after about 15 years in the industry, and I had some really good years, I worked with Ford, Chrysler, British Leyland, and some particularly memorable years at Saab in Sweden. I realized that though I loved the product, and I have to confess, I still do, uh, and I loved the job and the process and the people I worked with, I started to have some uh, severe misgivings about the industry itself I was working with. I thought that they had absolutely no foresight beyond the next quarter's sales. They weren't interested in really where transportation was going or what the automotive industry's contribution to our mobility was going to be. So I backed out of the car industry, spent a little bit of time working in alternative transportation design, and then uh, was invited to run Art Center's transportation design program at the European campus they had then. And that is really um, a, what has helped uh, align the stars for me to be here in front of you now to talk about car design. Although, as you'll see from the title, I'm not actually going to talk just about car design. I'm going to talk more about what the design of the automobile industry probably needs to be in future. And of course, that will very much inform what car designers need to be thinking about and what uh, car designers need to be informing the industry about. It's a two-way exchange, um, perhaps not the case at the moment. Uh, Art Center um, is, has um, produced a lot of, of the world's leading car designers, as Ron just said. The chances are that 50% of you here are driving a car that was designed or heavily influenced by an Art Center graduate. That gives us a profound responsibility at Art Center, as we have had so much influence in the car industry for 50 years or more now, to be really preparing our students in future to think very, very hard about what their real role is going to be in shaping our future mobility. Hence, my interest in mobility generally and sustainable, uh, issues of sustainability beyond just transportation. So, um, it's, I've realized, having been here for the last couple of days or so, that uh, there are huge parallels between the automobile industry and the oil industry. And it really is wakey, wakey call time for the auto industry now, even though they don't seem to be woken, uh, have come to be awake at the wheel just yet. Um, 
we have to get radical, both the industry has to get radical, and as designers, we have to get radical. We have to be thinking radically, and we have to think radical fast. And of course, that's one good thing that the automotive, or that's one thing that the auto industry knows how to do well fast. It might not seem very relevant when we're stuck on the 405 freeway, but uh, this time I'd like to see them apply fast to thinking very clearly about where they are going in future. It requires big picture thinking, and maybe this is something that is a signature of the way I like to work as a designer. These days you cannot be just um, focused on the product that you are designing or the system that you are designing. You have to understand the total context of what we are doing in any situation, and that we try to uh, in, uh, impress upon our students very much as well. Because you can't talk about car design without really looking at the whole design of the industry itself, as I said, and the way the world works around us, including energy and all sorts of other conditions. And talking of uh, big picture thinking, I just wanted to say as well, I've heard a lot about uh, future scenarios here. Uh, myself and some colleagues of mine at Art Center, a couple of whom are, who are here with me today, we've developed a, a set of uh, what we call mobility vision integration process cards, which is a tool to help designers and all creative people who are thinking about the future of transportation or industries related to transportation to um, understand how to cope with multiple and sometimes uh, overwhelming uh, changing future scenarios. And if you're interested in this, you're more than welcome to ask me questions about it afterwards or go to this website. Uh, mobilityvip.com. So we're agreed that um, there is imminent, unprecedented change for the established auto industry. It's, it's here now, even though they don't seem to have recognized it right the way across the industry. Uh, most of the reasons for this will be obvious to all of you here. We have the emergence of China and India as major automotive players. They've sprung up really quickly in this role. Uh, also, as we've heard a lot of people talk about uh, China and India's position in the oil industry, or the energy industry, I should say, and excuse my rather crude peak oil uh, chart compared to most that I've seen so far, but it gets the idea across. We are at the end of artificially cheap energy, and oil in particular, in my view. And also scarcity of unpolluted water. A lot of people ask me, what the hell's that got to do with making cars? Uh, well, it has quite a lot to do with industrial processes, and it's going to have a lot to do, as we've already heard, with the way our future economy shapes up as well. Ironically, as our riverbeds and aquifers dry up, a lot of the car markets are becoming saturated. Uh, there's also increasing public awareness about issues of sustainability, uh, perhaps faster awareness than within the industry itself. And there's also increasing public and political uh, distaste for the whole concept of urban congestion and sprawl. So what will these factors result in? Uh, the biggest upheaval, I think, will be the emergence of China and India uh, as, as car manufacturers. We've already heard from Dan Sperling about the $2,500 Tata Nano. Tata are having a little bit of trouble actually getting their first plant set up because there's some reaction to this in India already. But nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that shortly we'll see a car well south of $3,000 available to Indians. And apart from frightening the hell out of all the other car manufacturers who've never figured out how to do it for less than $13,000, uh, this is going to whet the appetite for cheap cars everywhere in the world, not only in emerging markets. This will put huge pressure on established car companies as they figure out how to respond. Uh, the bulk of the car market in this case will become commoditized, which uh, doesn't necessarily make the job of car designers more interesting. Uh, all of this is going to favor the newer car manufacturers in the emerging markets who don't carry around all the baggage that the legacy car companies do. We could argue that the uh, Japanese auto industry was the first major disruption to established car makers. I believe that the Chinese car industry will be the second major disruption, and of course China has about eight times the population of Japan as well. And this is going to mean massive disruption in the existing car industry. Um, but disruption is long, long overdue in the car industry, so I'm not actually afraid of disruption. Excuse me. Also, this isn't a challenge enough. There are several 
imminent uh, new products, disruptive products coming to the market, uh, like this Aptera on the left, the Tesla, which you've more likely heard about, and then also the uh, Progressive Automotive X Prize, which is encouraging a lot of companies to come out of the, um, out of the shadows and uh, try to pr convince them that they can put into production a car that will do 100 miles to the gallon day in, day out. Um, some of these co uh, disruptive car companies uh, may succeed, I hope so. Uh, some of them will crash and burn, but nevertheless, the media attention they will get is going to drastically alter public perceptions about what is possible. And there's also political pressure to fully recycle cars, particularly in Europe, and I mean fully recycle, not to downcycle. Uh, this is a huge challenge to all of us uh, in any, any sort of manufacturing industry because we're not quite sure how it should be done yet, but it needs to be done. And then we have our friend the greenhouse gases. Uh, there are complex relationships between vehicle operation when it comes to greenhouse gases, the manufacturing processes for the vehicles, how we recycle them, uh, the raw materials production, all of these things have a dramatic effect on greenhouse gas, and this is going to be a major, major challenge to the way vehicle designers, car designers think in future, let alone their industry. So an energy miracle tomorrow, if we could come up with a brilliant, pollution-free, abundant, infinite resource of energy, it's not going to solve urban gridlock. And it's not going to resolve the diminishing reserves of uh, non-renewable non uh, industrial materials. And it isn't going to uh, do anything for the appalling toxic waste stream that transportation uh, creates on our planet. Now, most of us do want to cling to our personal mobility. I, certainly I do, and I'm sure most of you do here. So what can we do about all of this? Well, one of the problems we have is actually oil is just too damn good. Um, but it's, as we all know, it has a greater energy density to any other, any other fuel source or thing that we can put into a vehicle to propel it forwards. And unfortunately, those of us who have been used to helping ourselves to oil for so long now have just squandered it on very inefficient forms of transportation. The internal combustion engine, for instance, even in its most sophisticated forms now, is only really about 20% efficient. That means only 20% of the energy of the uh, gasoline that goes into the engine creates useful power at the flywheel. By the time you've got uh, transmission losses uh, to take that power to the wheels, you've lost at least another 50% and uh, aerodynamic losses too. So a typical 150-pound driver is only one-twentieth of the weight of their typical 3,000-pound car, which means that for every gallon of gas they invest to transport themselves, they're investing another 20 gallons to t transport the car itself. And so if you do the sums, that means that, by my reckoning, only five-thousandths of the energy of the gas that you're using goes to propel us. The rest gets, wa gets wasted in heat, noise, and uh, other unpleasant things that go into the atmosphere. And it's worth thinking that if we'd invested as much money and research and human endeavor into batteries as we have in the internal combustion engine over the last century, we might be living in a, a very different world today and maybe there wouldn't even be an ASPO. Um, so we need to redefine acceptable efficiency standards for all of our transportation modes. And ultimately, we have to find renewable alternatives to oil to propel our transportation. But meanwhile, we have to use the oil that we do have left way, way more efficiently and parsimoniously than we have in the past. Uh, we have to encourage urban development and lifestyle habits that encourage us and reward us for not traveling so much in the first place. And new industrial economic models that do not require the transportation of goods all around the world. At the same time, we're seeing mass migration to urban living all across, well, in most parts of the world. Um, and this, in turn, is leading to the pressure for smarter urban transportation systems, particularly in those brand new cities that are being built in the Middle East and in China. And uh, we have uh, quite uh, vigorous sustainability policy agendas going on in some parts of the world already. Also, the future of mass transportation, in my opinion, in many parts of the world, will remain the automobile, but I'm going to qualify that in a little minute, in a minute or two. 
Uh, however, in many other parts of the world, the automobile will be and already is being discouraged as the main means of transportation. So what does this all mean for the car designer? It means that we have to work very hard with the engineers to drastically reduce the mass and aerodynamic drag that surrounds the occupant of the vehicle, like the Aptera, which uh, gets extraordinary energy efficiency out of its extraordinarily low aerodynamic drag and fairly light weight. Uh, we also have to offer the uh, public the right tool for the job. And by this, I mean for those 85% of us who tend to drive alone all of the time to commute to and from work, we need to be driving a one-seater vehicle with a minimum frontal area around us, minimum weight. Uh, we need to invest vigorously in autonomous driving systems. Autonomous driving systems. I can hear you already. Are you crazy? A lot of people argue about the viability of autonomous driving systems. Uh, they'll point out that there have been uh, trials already run over several decades ago which haven't worked out. But I believe that it's not really an option. I think that there are some very compelling aspects of uh, autonomous driving systems. And I think where we look to make it work is in biomimicry. We already have uh, GPS, we have radar, we have uh, infrared systems and uh, video um, uh, object recognition programs being developed, and those may well be part of the future, but I think that we have to look at swarming technology as a way to go where cars talk to each other and actually uh, share their collective memory and computer power to map out a picture of what's going on in real time so that uh, the, the vehicle takes care of a lot of, uh, well, takes care of getting you from A to B. And the advantages of this well, it means that in, uh, particularly in urban landscapes, we can remove the human element of driving. And once we remove the human element, that's a good reason, or, or human element is a good reason for all the accidents that happen because we're not actually as good at driving as we pretend we are. Once we'd have cars that don't crash into each other, we don't need a very heavy safety structure around them. Uh, it means probably we can lose at least 50% of the vehicle mass. Uh, it also allows platooning of cars because we'd have to take away, uh, if we take away the human um, slow reaction factor, we can actually make vehicles travel very close to each other because electronics can react very fast. And once you get cars platooning down the highways and freeways, it will also increase the aerodynamic gains. And it also means that we can stream far higher numbers of cars down our existing infrastructures. Uh, and you add all of these things together, and we get significant energy savings. And that's even before uh, we've looked at alternative propulsion systems, and we've heard a little bit about that already today. I think that alternative propulsion systems are, are, are absolutely an inevitability. Uh, it's too early, as far as I can see, it's too early to tell which will, will be the propulsion system of the future. I think for quite a long time now, we'll probably see various systems uh, not exactly competing with each other, but depending on geographic region, some uh, propulsion systems will be more appropriate than others, but we will have more choice. Uh, light materials, lightweight materials are going to be crucial for the development of cars in future. However, they must be uh, totally recyclable materials uh, that fit the life cycle analysis criteria. It's no good uh, using uh, composites which have high levels of toxins and are very difficult to recycle, although it's very tempting. Um, dealing with peak oil is going to be really important, uh, but cradle to cradle is as important to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I would argue. I've heard quite a lot of debate already in the last two or three days about whether we should uh, attend to peak oil first or whether climate change is more important. I don't see that it's a contest, I think, these and the whole issue of sustainability. However difficult it is for us as, as a species, we have to deal with all of these things at once. Because uh, if we only take care of one, the other one's going to kill us instead. So what does this all mean for the auto industry? Well, I would argue that the, uh, the current model that the automotive industry uses, its business model, is uh, totally outmoded. Uh, unless your name happens to be Honda, Toyota, or perhaps BMW, there are few car companies in the world that can make a, dis uh, a, um, a consistently decent uh, return on their investment year after year. Uh, so I see that designing, building, and selling cars no longer seems to be a viable business model. 
And yet, at the same time, it's quite clear that all around the globe, there's going to be a growing and quite significantly growing demand for personal mobility, and it's going to rise for a long time. So here's a good opportunity for car manufacturers to really redefine what their business is. And uh, I would see that providing a total mobility service would seem to offer a much greater opportunity for revenue stream, uh, even though building cars and infrastructure hardware might be a significant part of their uh, economic activity. Uh, but it would be a means to an end and not the end in itself. So there are lots of opportunities for the auto industry to, uh, to participate in developing, manufacturing, and operating complete mobility systems. Designers, and car designers in particular, need to be right in the middle of all of this because uh, it's not just about designing transportation devices and systems, it's also about creating a total mobility experience that will excite and compel people to drastically change their perceptions uh, and expectations of transportation in the future. You know, we can, we can talk all about, all we like about uh, smart new ways of getting around, but unless you and I are really excited about the possibility, the chances are we're not going to buy into it. So the auto industry needs to see these alternative transportation systems as a huge opportunity to redeploy its expertise and manufacturing capacity and not to see them as a threat. Um, and that's one thing that the, there are two things that the car industry do, does really, really, really well, and that is to develop extremely complex products and manufacture them at a very affordable price and extremely reliably. They're also pretty good at selling us things that we think we want but we don't really need, but that's another story. So I'm sure there might be questions from uh, uh, contentions that I've said, but uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Well, uh, now I'm going to introduce uh, Christer Lindstrom. Uh, he has the uh, distinction of being in the New York Times on Sunday on an article about a conference which he held last week about a revolutionary approach to transportation and something which uh, changes the paradigm from more cars to fewer vehicles. I'd like uh, Christer Lindstrom, who's from Sweden, the Institute of, of Sustainable Transportation, and more recently in Citra, a company he's uh, formed to deal with this new technology. Oh, and he's also going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Europe generally on transportation. Thank you, Ron. Um, do we have time? There it is. Um, I, I come from the Institute for Sustainable Transportation in Sweden, and uh, it was formed 2002 as a think tank. It was basically an idea um, me and a friend had from the Green Party. Is there any way we can do something that substantially changes the mode of transportation? Is it possible? So um, we met for a couple of years, explored different kind of options, interviewed all the people we can find that were mostly in Sweden, but also we got people from the United States. That's actually how I met Ron. And, and uh, eventually we came up with the concept and ID and the challenge that we wanted to explore. Um, uh, we, we labeled this uh, a new general transportation mode, or GTS system, a general transportation system. And the whole idea was to see how far can we push the limits um, without being prejudiced and how everything was today. So we tried to start from the blank slate. Basically, we came to, to Earth, there were no transportation system, what could be done from, from scratch? Um, I, I just want to mention something here. I saw the uh, California Energy Commission was here. Where, where do we have that person? Oh, whatever. Um, basically, my work here and why I'm here is basically because of an agreement between um, the Energy Commission of Sweden and the Energy Commission of California on behalf of the Swedish government and, and uh, the California government. And it's a memorandum of understanding between the state of California and Kingdom of Sweden on renewable fuels and energy. I'm very thankful for that happened in 2006 and something that has been the umbrella and my, the ability for me to operate here in California. Um, so, um, I'm just mentioning a few of, of the problems we're looking at, and you know them all. Um, pollution, peak oil, 
food, price, uh, food prices now, especially with alternative fuels and biofuels. Congestion, accidents, parking, urban sprawl, climate change, you know them all. And, and um, you know what? <laughs> After being here a couple of days, it was quite a lot of doom and gloom, so I thought this picture was kind of appropriate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I'm not sure that's the answer, so hope, hopefully you can find something better. So, <laughs> so uh, let us wish now for a great transport system. What, what, what would we want it to have? What, what kind of parameters and attributes do we want from a great transportation system? Well, we want it to be safe, of course. We don't want to have 40,000 people killed, as you are here in, in the United States. There's also actually 40,000 by chance in Europe every year killed. Um, I don't know how big Sacramento is, 100,000. It's in two and a half years, as one Sacramento goes away, but just because people get killed, I think it's quite awful. Um, we want it to be fast. We want to be uh, accessible today. The car-centric um, transportation, and actually also trains and planes, they are not so accessible to everyone. It's about 20, we, very interesting study was performed by the University of Gothenburg, Chalmers University. Uh, in, in Sweden, and it turns out that 24, 25 percent of the people who do not use a car actually wants to use a car. But they can't for various reasons. They don't have a driver license. They don't can't afford. They can't afford it. Or there are many different kinds of reasons. Uh, so we want to be accessible for more people. We definitely want it to be automatic. I don't know why it's called the automobile because it's anything but auto. You have to drive it yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we want it to be comfortable, and, and I think the car industry has really provided us with, with very, very great um, cars. I actually love the car myself, so, so it's a very, a very comfortable thing, and it's very easy. I understand it's a very seductive thing to use. Uh, after hearing several of the um, uh, speeches this afternoon, we want it definitely to be solar powered, and, and we want it to be reasonably priced. It doesn't have to be cheap has to be reasonably, so we can actually have different price um, tariffs depending on our economy, our need of comfort, speed, etc. Um, of course, we want it to be low resource impact on, on, on the, the, the earth resources. We want to have a low footprint. And very important, we want it to be personal or public. If you want to have it personal, it should be possible. However, it should also be possible to use it public in any way. Um, we want it to have high capacities. We can actually replace most of the transportation doing today. And very important also, we want to have exciting design. We don't want a square box going around in like the old Volvos from my country. Sorry about those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it's important to have something that, that's attracting that we want. And I think that's a very important point. So. Um, uh, what's been, I, I've been asked to tell about what's going on in Europe here, and, and we have basically three places right now in Europe where there's development going on. It's in Sweden, in Poland, and the United Kingdom. And um, what's happening there is, uh, does that come here? Whoops. Um, we have a three-mile commercial system being implemented right now in Heathrow. Uh, it's at uh, Terminal 5, from Terminal 5 to the parking. Uh, we have uh, ha almost a half mile test track in Uppsala right now. It's just been extended a little. Um, you're going to see a movie about that uh, very soon also. Um, there's a test track underway in Poland, uh, in uh, the Opola city, if anybody knows that. And we have just incorporated another company in Sweden called Beamways uh, with venture capital in 2008. And all these are in very, very, very stages of development. But there's especially one that's come very far. And I want to show you a movie about that. So please, I think we can start the movie now.
offline. It's a bit like an elevator. Question that I always get: Is this futuristic? Is this Jetsons or something? Yeah, yeah, that that was probably true 10, 15 years ago, but it really isn't anymore. This is this is really can happen. We don't know if this works 100% yet. There are probably going to be many issues, many flaws about this technology, but it, it's pretty exciting. And just as Jeff mentioned, the, the how the way we do our cities and the, the way we do our, our, our societies. I think also Dan Sperling mentioned this, uh, has been very much based around the car. And if we have a new mode of transportation that's more effective, more fast, more safe, more reliant, more comfortable, etc., all these parameters we're trying to address, the way we do the cities will be quite different. So that's why we had this conference last week we called the Podcar City instead of the Car City. And, and we see quite a change there. Uh, it's been interesting to see reactions in the press to this technology. You see a couple of quotes here. I uh, also want to mention that today we have 10 cities in Sweden joining forces for implementation of podcasts. That group was formed in May 2008. We now also have a um, British city who wants to join, and I expect to have at least Santa Cruz here in California join, and Ithaca and New York to join soon. Um, we have today $50 million in allocation for the Swedish government, and we expect more from the European Union in 2009 for actually building a pilot system. And there, there is quite astonishing the amount of money that's been committed to this technology for the next five, six years. If you look into the Master UAE, um, uh, um, United Arab Emirates, 
Um, it, and what's being done by POSCO, POSCO owns this Vectors company, by the way, it's the second largest company in, in South Korea, it's a steel company. Uh, they committed almost 10 billion US dollars so far. So it, I, I don't see this as futuristic. It's it, interesting, it's not, the technology is not 100% ready yet, but it's definitely not futuristic, it's closer than that. Um, just very brief note, the uh, vast majority of our travels can easily be replaced by podcars. Um, if this works, we, we have four corners that we actually address every day, and this is kind of an exception what we're doing here. But most people, we use it to go to work, to school and kindergarten, we use it for shopping, and we use it for leisure. And those four corners are very repetitive, and it's been shown again and again in studies that humans are very they're, they're very habitual. They do the same thing over and over again every day, every week, every year. And so it's quite easy actually to, to pro make prognosis of demand of, of transportation. Um, and that makes that these kind of systems actually can be implemented in a quite intelligent way. It has very dramatic effects. If this works, we have at least, I'm being very conservative here, about 10 times more energy efficient. I, I guess at least twice or three times that. Uh, it can be totally solar powered and, and with some wind and hydro for peak and night, of course. Um, it is over 100 times less resource demanding. And if you wonder why, how can it be such a big difference? Well, they don't go and park and litter the streets like our cars do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, since I've been working with this, I'm starting to seek parked cars as litter. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm amazed myself about the change of, of how, how I see cars. And, and because they've been used over and over again. Of course, they've been washed and serviced every day, but basically, they're never parked. They're always in service almost all day and all night. And I, I bet it's a thousand times more fun. You just press the button and enjoy, you read a book or you drink and drive, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, 95% uh, less consumption of liquid fuels for transportation is not only possible. I think, and this is what I say, I think it's close to criminal not to pursue the, this technology further and really investigate it. So I want to finish with a picture I got from Ron, a solar-powered pod hanging under, that's another idea. And thank you very much. We'll have a few... Uh, minutes for questions. Um, I've been getting some very interesting questions here. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, several questions came in about congestion. And I, I like this uh, twist to it. Uh, someone brings up the Jevons paradox. A lot of us have, in the peak oil movement have uh, thought about that a lot. In the U.S., uh, from 1973 to 1990, we improved automobile efficiency by 30% but people drove them 29% more miles per year. <laughs> this to be, seems to be an example of the rebound effect or Jevons paradox. Toyota is building a Prius factory for China. Will this save oil or will efficient cars uh, just allow for more driving? Uh, anyway, you, you want to take, take that one on? Um. Of course, uh, I think the, co the actual cost of doing each journey will have a lot to do with um, determining whether people make the journey or not. So yes, more efficient cars are likely to, um, are likely to increase people's tendency to drive. Um, we haven't talked at all about the possibility of uh, road pricing or anything like that, which are other ways of, uh, of, of helping to uh, reduce or, or spread out the demand for road space to, uh, to try and avoid congestion. I think, um, I think that efficiency, uh, we, have to, we have to create more efficient vehicles, that's for sure. And then how we, um, how we deal with the congestion, the, the unintended consequence of that, there are a ver variety of ways that I think we can look at dealing with that. Uh, one advantage of autonomous driving systems, or as uh, Krista was pointing out with uh, podcars, is that uh, one of the congestion problems we face in many urban landscapes is, the, is, the, is parked vehicles. So autonomous cars can always trundle off when you've got out of it and uh, go off and, 
um, and, and be useful to somebody else waiting to make a journey just as a, as a pod car can, and that's a, that is a good way of um, easing congestion. Uh, some parts of Europe that I've lived, it seems to actually cost more to keep your car parked than it actually to drive around in it, so that's another, another thing to think about. So maybe I could rephrase this. Will we be seeing more cars or fewer cars? Christopher, would you want to say something about that? Well, I stick out my cheek, you say that here? Yes. Okay, and I say that actually I think we won't have a peak oil problem soon. If, if vodka technology works, uh, fuel is going to be $25 a barrel and nobody wants it. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not joking. <laughs> Look what happened to the mail. Well, okay, this uh, kind of goes in with this question. When will cars uh, go the way of horses? They just become something we play with on the weekend. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, basically. It's going to be uh, something you polish and really, um, I'm going to have one at least, a sob, I think, I like those. <laughs> and and um, polish it and take care of it. And every fourth Sunday, I take it out and really enjoy the ride with ethanol, of course, in the, in the tank. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say something about this, Brian? <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know. Uh, cars right now are kind of stupid. Um, they're a lot dumber than a horse. You know, a horse won't run over a child or over the side of a cliff, but a car will. And so I think if we want to keep cars around, we're going to have to make them a lot smarter than they are today. Um, I, th I think there are a lot of people who uh, enjoy owning cars, but don't particularly enjoy driving them, depending on which part of the world we're talking about. So. Um, you know, one of the advantages of uh, trying to get alternative transportation systems is that people are still free to own a car and polish it or drive it out on a Sunday, even at maybe at exorbitant cost. But by providing other means of transportation, it still means that people can um, to do their more utility transportation uh, in, a, in a much better way. We had several questions about safety. Uh, what about safety appliances like the crash resistance, crushability, side impacts, and then? Um, is there anything in car design that can reduce the amount of roadkill? I thought that was interesting. Have, and then one more thing uh, along this line. Uh, for the pod car, uh, what about personal safety? What about criminal uh, threats from other users of the system? I've been pickpocketed in uh, the Mexico City uh, subway. Yeah, go ahead. Should I take the safety issue first? Okay, yeah. uh, it's a very common question. Well, um, all, the, all the stations are TV monitors, so it's, it takes a pretty stupid thief to go into a pod car. It's been, been having, first, you need a ticket, and then you're going to be photographed before you get in. And, and we, while you're in, there's actually an emergency button that takes you to the nearest po police station. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, really. So, so, but it will eventually happen, yes. Oh, that's so right. Something so. will happen sometimes. Some stupid person will actually do something, but it's going to be pretty easy to solve that crime. So, so you're saying that you're, you stay in the vehicle. You know, one time I was in Mexico City, and I got in this uh, uh, Volkswagen. They call them Bolcho down there. And the guy had a tear gas canister behind my seat. I was uh, in a place with a glass uh, between me and him, uh, safety glass, and then I couldn't get out because he actuated a button to open the door. You're, so it's kind of like that, you're trapped. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Sounds okay. like a good system. Uh, what is the line's capacity, Christer? What is the top speed and the cost per mile of a guideway? Oh. With this, including the station. Oh, I, I get that question a lot. It's very hard to answer. Basically, what, what are people prepared to pay? And, and uh, I can say this. It's, if you consider how much you pay for transportation today, it's between 20 to 30 percent of your total budget. Anyone argue about that? I think that's total. Here also in the United States, that's what we have in Sweden. And, and um, that, that's basically with, with the medium-sized income what you pay, and that's more than enough, way more than enough to, to, to build the system, maintain them, operate, and, and use them. So that's my answer to that question. Of course, I have hard facts, but it takes too much time for this to answer here. I guess people who want to know those things can get to me afterwards. There are several questions about efficiency, but unfortunately, uh, uh, Dan Sperling is not here. He talked about hydrogen vehicles. Do you have anything about that uh, you could say, Brian, about um, hydrogen, uh, diesel, 
uh, running at high efficiency and uh, manual transmissions versus uh, automatic transmissions, things like that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I worked a bit on a continuously variable transmission, which is quite efficient. Um, and um, I don't know, the life cycle for different fuels, uh, like Dan said, it really depends on what your feedstock is, where the fuel is coming from. But um, yeah, there are a lot of efficiency issues with hydrogen in particular because there are so many conversion steps in producing hydrogen and then storing it and then turning it into electricity. So uh, in particular, hydrogen is often criticized for being a very inefficient path uh, to a vehicle fuel in particular. Um, Paul McCready was actually a really uh, big skeptic of hydrogen and would talk about inefficiencies quite a bit. Um, but uh, as for uh, other efficiencies, um, yeah, automatic transmissions are very inefficient. Um, manual transmissions are more efficient if you know how to drive <laughs> the car properly. Um, so. um, I, this one is a very timely considering all the subjects that we've talked about this week in uh, uh, the financial markets. Will there be enough capital to build high-speed trains or electric light rail if the financial system collapses? or goes, we go into hyperinflation. And um, so, anybody? Um, well, I think that's one of the problems that we, we are faced with, that in many parts of the world, and this part in particular, there isn't really the, there hasn't been, even before the financial crashes of last week, the political or the, um, the economic will to, um, to spend large sums of money on, on um, transportation infrastructure. Um, which is why I believe that for good or for bad, probably the automobile is going to remain the mass transportation of the future in many parts, where you are in, a, in an environment, uh, perhaps as in China, where uh, there is the, um, at least the political will to do these things and these investments, and where they're creating brand new cities, then it's quite a, a lot easier to uh, build in uh, impressive new infrastructures and high-speed trains and things like that. Which is why, in the automotive industry, it has to be uh, it has to take the responsibilities of seeing the vehicle, the car, as the uh, mass transit of the future. It has to uh, take real responsibility to make sure that it's, it's as sort of efficient and ecologically responsible as possible. Um, there were some this, uh, pictures in the last couple of days about um, autonomous vehicles. I saw. Uh, demonstration on YouTube of a bunch of cars at maybe a quarter or half second interval going down the highway together. Uh, and then what you're talking about too, Christer, involves a, a similar type of thing. Would either Jeff, you, or uh, Christer talk about the, the swarming, that is to say, vehicles coupled together or running at very tight intervals, uh, and uh, is, is this feasible both on uh, standard roads as well as on uh, rail. And, and the, the, the related question is, um, the, the, in those pictures that we saw, the pod cars were not running at particularly high density. I think that was just a pictorial thing, but can they uh, scale up to high density transportation, you know, high capacity? Jeff, maybe start first. Yeah, I mean, particularly if uh, vehicles are on guided, uh, guided some rail system, I think it's uh, very easy to, to, to platoon them uh, close quarters. I don't think we're ready to do it right now on, on, uh, on regular automobiles and roads, but I do believe that uh, if we do put some serious research into uh, autonomous driving systems, I think that's one of the great advantages that we can get. And if you're running several vehicles at high speed, only a few inches apart, rather than now where they tend to run at, say, when we're driving on the freeway at 60 or 70 miles an hour. People drive too close to each other anyway. They don't allow enough braking distance. When there is a, an incident, you have cars slamming into the back of each other at very, very high closing speeds. Those vehicles are only two or three inches apart in the first place. If there do, does happen to be a systems problem, then the, the results are not nearly as calamitous as they are now. So I mm. think it's very, very feasible. And I always remind people that when we're flying in a commercial aircraft, 
uh, that four out of five times when the, uh, the plane lands, it's being done on autopilot anyway, I think. So and we seem to be quite happy to allow that to happen in, uh, when we're flying. So why don't we trust it to happen on, on road vehicles? The, the, the trick will be, though, is the crossover time as we introduce this technology into existing infrastructures where we have uh, legacy vehicles which don't have the technology and mixing it with vehicles that are autonomous. But that I, I, I still, my instinct tells me that if we, if we really try hard and work on this, it, it can be done and it offers a, a very viable solution. And, and just one more point before I hand over to Krista. You know, one of, the, one of the biggest wastes of energy in the automobile is acceleration and then conversely in braking because we're, we're, when we brake, use the brakes, we're, we're wasting some momentum. And when you see people on the freeway continually jumping on and off their brakes or the gas pedal, that's where the gasoline gets used or the diesel gets used. If we can get cars to drive autonomously and platoon and smooth those speeds out, that again will create huge uh, energy efficiencies as well. So I, I believe it's really something that we have to go after. Are you going to say some more about that? Uh, just two simple answers. Uh, platooning is very easy uh, if there are two and two. Um, and if you have two, you can do another two plus two together to four, etc. Uh, platooning is quite complicated when it's more than two vehicles that needs to platoon. It's a very dangerous also, actually. Um, so it has to be in steps. Um, second, um, the capacity question. A uh, usual uh, lane on the freeway has a capacity th theoretically of 1,700 1, cars per hour. Uh, for pod cars, it's, it's um, sorry, 1,700 people per hour, not cars. Um, for pod cars, it's about twice that, that figure right now. That's the proved figure. Um, by platooning, you can double it. So somewhere in the region, seven, 7,500 per hour. That's the total capacity that's accessible today. It might increase in the future. Huh. Well, um, I got one more uh, card here that I want to read. Um, someone, thank you very much. Someone said, thank you for outstanding, visionary, exciting talks at the end. I want to uh, throw my hat in the ring with that and say thanks to our uh, speakers this afternoon. So I think this is interesting because we know that petroleum has been used primarily for transportation, especially in our country. And uh, this is an interesting place to imagine our uh, leaping off point for next year's uh, conference. Um, we are going to have uh, an opportunity for everybody after uh, we're having a, a reception for uh, about an hour. And at 6.30, right, we will meet back here in the room and there will be a panel which involves a number of the speakers getting back together up here. And I uh, would... Uh, is there any other announcement, uh, Steve? Um, maybe two more. Um, one, uh, it's interesting, somebody sent us a, a, a brought us up a, a question saying, can the next ASPO conference be expanded to 100,000 attendees <laughs> <laughs> over the internet? Um, having a viewing, well, anyway, they went on from there. Um, there's a 90% chance that the next conference will be back in Denver next year, and there's a high probability, in fact, we're, we'll, we're dedicating some funds to try to make it available via webcast, uh, much more broadly. Uh, so I just thought I'd mention that as, as while there are more folks here. Um, but I, I don't know. Okay. Um, one other thing, um, there's a fellow that put up a pod car um, demonstration yesterday. How many saw that yesterday? Are there people who would be interested in seeing that again? It would be possible for him to set that up. Do um, you want to set that up again, Bill? The people want to see it again. Um, it's uh, a couple of young fellows can give him a hand uh, setting this up, perhaps over in this area. I think that'd be fun over the over the cocktail hour here. Um, that's it until 6.30. Thank you very much.